Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, first of all, thanks for attending this um, event. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Michael O'Lawling to you. Um, and first of all, I'm actually going to thank him for accepting our invitation to present a lecture here. This, for those of you who don't know, this is the sector of the university linked directly to our deanship for undergraduate studies devoted to teaching and learning. So feel free to come back here whenever you want to talk about these issues and use this room which is specifically intended for this purpose. Um, Dr. Michael O'Lawling is professor in the School of Education and the Derner School of Psychology at Adelphi University. And I read a, a little bit about Adelphi University. Uh, I'm actually fascinated. Adelphi University is a highly awarded research university offering exceptional liberal arts and sciences programs and professional training with particular strength in arts and humanities, social sciences, business, and education. Adelphi University was founded in 1896, which makes it like almost a little over 120 years, twice as old as our Unicamp, and is Long Island's oldest private educational university. Today, Adelphi University serves over 7,600 students at its main campus in Long Island. Dr. O'Lolling is co-editor of the, the journal Psychoanalysis, Culture, and Society. He writes on trauma, psychosis, childhood subjectivity, and refugee and social justice issues. He is also the editor for several famous book series. He has a private practice for psychotherapy and psychoanalysis for children and adults on Long Island, Long Island New York, the state of New York. And it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce you to Dr. Michael Lolling. Thanks a lot. If I speak too quickly, please remind me and I will be glad to slow down. Uh, I, I do indeed work in two... Uh, first of all, it is really a pl privilege for me to be here speaking with you today. I'm very happy to have the opportunity. I will present what I hope is a fairly radical perspective on the work we do in universities. And I will express grave concern about the direction in which universities seem to be trending. My remarks do not apply to Brazil because I know nothing of your context, so you'll have to make that decision. But from what I see in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom and United States, there is a trend, a very worrying trend towards shifting the basis of knowledge away from ideas and understanding towards a much more structured technical learning experience. And so I fear that we're risk training students very narrowly to fit functions in society rather than to be thoughtful, critical citizens who can defend our democracy in times of worry. I live in the United States, I'm originally from Ireland. I live in the United States and certainly we have a lot of worry at the moment about the totalitarian trend that's coming out of the populist politics in the US. And I've met people here who express similar worries about a fear of a return of dictatorship. I know nothing in society that can protect us from that better than universities. Universities are places where students who come in, living in little bubbles, have the possibility of expanding their thought and their ideas and leaving with an understanding of how the world works and therefore how to be in the world in a way that's impactful and so on. So I'd like to begin by... Uh, I did some slides, so if you have difficulty with your with following the English, sorry, this would be it. I, I will use the slides and you can follow along with that and I'll be glad to elaborate here and there and to take questions. Uh, one of the great influences on my thinking was Inácio Martín Barro, a Jesuit priest and psychologist in El Salvador. He was gunned down by government soldiers with some colleagues, his housekeeper and his housekeeper's daughter in 1989. Martin, Martin Barro chose to speak truth to power. His work fused his skills as a psychologist, his humanitarian impulses, 
his belief in social justice principles and liberation theology, uh, commitment to praxis and to conscientization, you can pronounce this word better than me, conscientization advocated by Paul F. Freire. Martin Barrault's work makes a strong moral claim in that he actually spoke truth to power in a way that mattered and because he focuses significantly on what is perhaps the greatest weapon that can be turned against totalitarian regimes, the recovery of dangerous memory. This is a quote from his work. Thus, the recovery of a historical memory supposes the reconstruction of models of identification that, instead of chaining and caging the people, open up the horizon for them toward their liberation and fulfillment. Is this mic doing okay? Am I holding it? Is it okay? Thank you. He says, each person needs to say the word of one's existence. And following Freire, he suggests that through the gradual decoding of their world, people grasp the mechanisms of oppression and dehumanization. And one of my arguments today is that whatever discipline we are in, we should be concerned about oppression and dehumanization. As Martin Barrault learned to his cost, recovery of memory requires the return of the shadow side of history. That means the dark side. And it becomes a narrative that counters the master narrative a narrative that counters the official story, the party line, the received ideology. Hence, recuperation of memory is extremely dangerous work to undertake because of its revolutionary potential. There are many, many people who would greatly prefer that we forget than that we remember. And in fact, if you look at, I have no idea how the media works here, but if you look at CNN, for instance, or any of the national or international news media, they live in the present, and there is no historical memory and no past, and I think that's extremely dangerous for society when we have no capacity to remember. Here's another quote from Martin Barrault. If they attain a clear-sighted historical consciousness, Latin Americans will be able to use events and facts to evaluate the ideological proposals being put forward, and in so doing, they will also be able to unmask the Orwellian quality of the dominant language. What this doesn't say, of course, is whether having unmasked the problem, you have the power to change anything. And that's the second question. Now, the second thought in my thought in my talk today is the notion of teacher as analyst of inaudible histories. And I will argue that when students come to college, each student comes bearing a history and a set of memories, and that our job is to try and find a way to make an opportunity for that history to be made explicit. And the work that I speak about here draws indirectly on Francois Devon and Jean-Max Goudier's book, History Beyond Trauma. The role of teacher as analyst, therefore, refers to the role of teacher as documenter and recuperator of memory and history. The chronicler who keeps the record of a gesture that has been silenced. Clearly, this pedagogy doesn't work if you have a received body of knowledge and you believe your work in a classroom is to go in and lecture that knowledge to students and then see if they received it. This requires a form of knowing that's directly connected with the understanding students bring with them to school. The meeting, and this is a pedagogical meeting, in the presence of a sensitive teacher attuned to fossil messages or Embody, embodied or hidden messages in the being of the student eventually leads to the possibility of finding tattered remnants of those severed social links and stitching together a patch in the ruptured history of a person or community or people. It would be particularly true, for instance, for indigenous people whose uh, ways of life have been torn from them by westernized technological development. It would certainly be true of refugees and would be true of many people who come from migrant backgrounds of any type, which is most people, in fact. What seems to be called for then, as the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben notes in Remnants of Auschwitz, is some means of bringing the unspeakable back into the discourse of pedagogy. Can we talk about the things we would prefer not to? A possible solution, therefore, to recuperating dangerous memory would appear to lie in the acutely attuned listening gained by combining the socio-political sensibility suggested by Martin Burroughs' work and the attunement of fossil memories and history suggested by Devon and Goodyear 
with an ethical sensibility suggested by Giorgio Agamben. So my work tries to fuse together a philosophy of college teaching that pulls on these three theoretical sources. And if you're interested in this work, by the way, I do have a few papers that from which I drew the material for this talk, and I would be happy to share them with you. This sensibility is articulated further by Avishai Margalit in The Ethics of Memory. Margalit's hope is that our capacity to bear moral witness can lead to the creation of ethical communities of caring that serve as a bulwark against the repetitions of tyranny. So I'd like you to sort of take these two ideas, the possibility of developing an ethical community of caring in a college classroom or in a college division, such as a department of whatever, and then tying that in with the possibility of developing in students the capacity to stand against tyranny by recognizing the forces of tyranny. Mergulit asks, why cannot humanity be shaped into a community of memory, and why cannot it be formed into an ethical community based on the thick relation of caring? Ought not this moral community have some minimal sense of memory for, say, the Gulags, the Kulaks, Majdanek, and Treblinka, Hiroshima, and Nanking, as warning posts in human moral history? And the question for me there, of course, is whether we're about giving something to students or assisting students to embark on a journey. It is hardly a surprise that psychoanalytically informed depth pedagogy, and this is the name I give to the work that I do, I am also trained as a psychoanalyst, is actually losing whatever ground it may have held in mainstream university education, as the demand from administrators, society, and the students themselves, and their parents sometimes, is for practical know-how that, quote, works. This creates demand for didactic techniques that reduce knowledge to positive certitudes to be dispensed and ingested. In the US there is a very, well the United States has long had an anti-intellectual streak, but now it's becoming a very powerful force in universities, saying students shouldn't study philosophy, they shouldn't study the arts, they shouldn't take courses in aesthetics, why do they need theoretical physics? They're going out to do a job, let's train them for the job. So there's a tremendous instrumental focus entering education, partly because of popular, populist opinion, partly because of government policies, and partly, unfortunately, because the disciplines themselves accredit themselves and create regulations to enforce this highly atomized form of education. Teachers offer lectures and tests. Students then, in return, offer proof of mimetic understanding, mimetic meaning making back a copy of the teacher's knowledge. Where is the space for constructing new understandings and demonstrating ownership of ideas? One of the writers who most influenced me to approach pedagogy from a depth perspective is Shoshana Feldman. She's a professor of French, I think currently at Emory University in Atlanta, but when she wrote her most famous book, uh, called Jacques Lacan and the Adventure of Insight, she was at Yale at the time. And then she has written another excellent paper on teaching as well. And she interprets Jacques Lacan from a pedagogical perspective. Such a pedagogy poses the question as to how college students might think beyond their means. Do we have an expectation that students can push to a new place? And I have one paper that I wrote called Thinking Beyond Our Means, which is an illustration of my own teaching and an attempt to push students to to go beyond the boundary of just giving back. What distinguished Jacques Lacan's life as well as his work was a profound impatience with the sovereign order of things. He was what we often call a maverick or a contrarian. If he saw something, he would find a reason to disagree if at all possible. As Feldman notes, Lacan's work underlines the importance of recognizing systems of signification and challenging them. The true contrarian challenge is whatever comes the way. Paul Freire would ask, is it possible to learn the question? Is it possible to create a space where questioning is possible? Lacan was particularly critical of the foreclosure of exploration in the discourse of the university. He has a series of discourses, and one is the language and thought process that's, that's oops, I'm going to fall over this thing. The language and thought process of the university. 
The predetermined insight that is proffered and taken in by students is indeed blind insight. The words are empty, Lacan calls it that plural deep, and instead of ignorance presenting as an opportunity to develop authentic questions and full speech, that plural plan, students are left with the illusion of understanding. You know, we have this expression, students take the test, then they flush the toilet, and all the knowledge is gone. Because it's not about understanding, it's about regurgitation, and then you can let it go and forget it. And so the question is, is that, does the professor hold the illusion that that is understanding? Because the students certainly don't seem to. How can we avoid cultivating such an illusion? Returning to Freud, Feldman notes that ignorance is rooted in resistance to coming to know the latent, that's a spelling error there, sorry, the latent ideas that are part of our own experience. A Lacanian informed pedagogy is one in which teacher, through critical questions, repunctuates the narrative of the student, such that those points of resistance create conditions for the possibility of new knowledge making. Students often hesitate, and when I was a student I hesitated equally to ask questions because of revealing our ignorance. I think it is very helpful if we can teach students that ignorance is a virtue, that people who are not ignorant cannot learn. So ignorance is good. And so students need to come to us with their ignorance and we need to find way, ways to explore the points of resistance that will move them to a newer place. In a pedagogical situation, therefore, critical questions about points of resistance can be posed either about the student's own dispositions of ignorance or about the potential for foreclosure embodied in the material to which students are exposed. So there are two potential difficulties. One is the resistance within the student to exposing themselves to ways of thinking that go beyond their own work. If any of you ever read a book that came out in 1968, William Perry, he was a counselor at Harvard undergraduate and he interviewed the students each year and they came in well, they came in and talked to him and he heard over over a pattern and finally he began to interview them would say to them what stood out for you this year and he saw that it was exquisitely difficult for 18 and 19 year olds to move beyond a simple univocal perspective of how the world is that they were raised with in their high schools and in their families and that shifting them from that, first of all, to a relativistic world, where indeed there were multiple points of view, caused a lot of dissonance. In a university, in fact, a university really ought to be called a multi-diversity, in a university there ought to be a space for pluralism of ideas, so no matter what division you teach in, ideally when they've taken eight or ten classes, they've found at least two or three people, professors who ferociously disagree with each other and think everybody else is wrong, so that they have to wrestle with that. Perry would say that the next step for a student then is to move beyond this relativistic position that there are multiple ways of viewing a problem to develop an ethical stance that helps them to choose the one that seems like a good fit for them in understanding the world. So one of the ways, one of the, the first point here is that one of the ways we can do this is by posing questions about the student's own dispositions and ignorance and the second one is by looking carefully at the texts to which students are exposed and helping them deconstruct and understand the blind spots of the writing because every writing is written from the perspective of a writer and so it's inherently univocal also unless it's an edited collection and most edited collections tend to be fairly univocal because people invite people whose work they like and admire rather than people who are, have contrary contrarian views to, to contribute so it's, so it's a lot of teaching our students a singular worldview rather than a multivocal perspective. <coughs> People familiar with Paul Afrede's work will see resonance here with his famous expression, reading the word, reading the world. And of course many, many university professors would say, not my problem. My problem is reading the word, reading the world is not what university is about. I think the danger in that is we could become like the Titanic. This thing could sink while we're talking, and we wouldn't know that it was gone until it was gone. Just go to the United States and ask bookstore owners what happened to their bookstores. Poof! They disappeared. They're predicting that within 10 years, half the shopping centers in the United States would be closed. Poof! Because of online ordering. And there's a real possibility that our work as professors will disappear also because of the advances in artificial intelligence. So if we sit in our 
offices and refuse to think about our stance on the world, we risk being rendered obsolete while we're, while we're not thinking. So I think that's very worrisome to me. The pedagogical question crucial to Lachlan's own teaching then is, where does the text precisely make no sense? That is, resist interpretation. And any of you who have ever read Lachlan's work, he's the prototypical best example of this because he wrote incomprehensibly dense, non-understandable work and he happily told us the purpose of reading is to not understand rather than to understand. We have to engage with the ignorance. Where does what I see and what I read resist my understanding? Where is the ignorance, the resistance to knowledge located? And what can I learn from the locus of that ignorance? How can I interpret it out of the dynamic ignorance I encounter? And how can I turn ignorance into an instrument of teaching? This would, and I'm a hypocrite, you all may be hypocrites as well, I'd happily admit to being a hypocrite. Before I meet my students, I prepare a syllabus which has a prospectus of work that lays out the things they're expected to do. If I truly believed in that last quote, I wouldn't prepare any syllabus. I'd say, let's begin and see what you need to know, and when we find the points of ignorance, we can work from there. The wise people, and I use those words facetiously, who govern my life and my work, would not be happy with that decision. They would greatly prefer a syllabus laid out in advance with assignments and so on. That's just how it works. Clearly, this is impossible without critical dialogue around complex texts and interpretations. So, you know, they've done research in schools in the United States over the years, and they've found that 90% of the time in high school, children sit passively. Or may, no, 90% of the time in elementary school, Children sit passively and do not speak. And by the time children get to high school, it's 95. I suspect if you went to an average American college and walked around the campus and peered in the doors of people's lectures, as I sometimes do, just to see what's going on, I think you'd go to 99%. There is no space, most of the time, for student voice. There's no space for dialogue. And without dialogue, I would argue, learning is impossible. I'll give you an example. My first year as a professor in 1986, I was teaching in Ohio, I'd never been a professor before, so I did what the idiot before me did. I got a textbook and I copied that person's syllabus and it became mine. And I went in to lecture the students. And they didn't have to do any work because I was working at the top. Think of it like this, if you wanted to lose weight, some of you may wish to lose weight, you could say to me, Michael, bring in a treadmill into the classroom and run at the front of the room each week. That would be very helpful. And I could run on the treadmill. And I can only guarantee you one thing. One person would lose weight. Mm -hmm. Well, if it was me, I might run that hard, but theoretically, I would lose weight, and you'd be watching me. So when we do education, that doesn't require students to activate the mental treadmill and do their own running, it seems to me futile. My students would do no work. And I, there was absolutely no compelling reason they could do, should do work. They were totally rational people. I was doing the work for them. I was telling them what was in the book, helping them get my understanding, and then testing them to see if they received what I said. And one day, they couldn't understand something. I used a trade paperback book to supplement the textbook. They couldn't understand some complicated concept. And I said, let me explain. I sat on the table just like here, and I talked for 40 minutes. I gave a fabulous, spellbinding lecture. And then I had the wisdom to say, do that help? And they said, no. And it couldn't help, because I was trying to implant my understanding in their heads, rather than help them arrive at an understanding of their own. So this issue of dialogue is really critical for me. I cannot imagine a form of pedagogy that can do anything other than reproduce that doesn't involve student dialogue. Or in disciplines where there are, for instance, mathematics and business, where there's a lot of uh, cases and problems. Students working collectively to solve and figure out solutions, rather than imbibing solutions from professors. Feldman argues that the task of a teacher practicing such a pedagogy is to become a student of the student's resistance. It is out of the patient's active ignorance, out of the patient's speech, which says much more than itself knows that the analyst will come to learn the student's own unconscious knowledge, that knowledge that is inaccessible to itself because it cannot tolerate knowing that it knows. And you might not know much about psychoanalysis, but I've studied it a long time and I practice being a psychoanalyst and we know that if somebody comes into work in psychoanalysis, for instance, somebody who's training in the field, it could take many, many years for them to get to a point where they understand their own resistances. 
we have deep, deep reasons for resisting new knowledge. I remember when I enrolled in psychoanalytic training, uh, more out of desperation than out of intellectual curiosity, I was having other issues in my professional life at the time. And my uh, professor who was in charge of the program said, Michael, you will need to be in analysis. I said, great. And I avoided the subject. And one day, he called me in the hall and said, Michael, you were supposed to be in analysis. Have you started? So I made an excuse. I said, no, I haven't found anybody yet. He says, come with me. I can make a recommendation. I actually had aspects of my own life I didn't want to explore, and I knew that I didn't want to work with a female analyst for reasons I won't tell you, and I certainly didn't tell him. But he recommended a woman. And since I didn't want to reveal my ignorance to him, I accepted and went to work with this woman. And it was, she did this with me. She allowed me a space where I could confront the things inside me that caused me to resist finding out new things. That's not a slow process, but it certainly was very helpful. So a pedagogy of uncertainty and perhaps even incomprehension is therefore called for. So this word incomprehension is important for, for instance, Jacques, uh, Claude Lanzmann, who made the nine and a half hour film about the Shoah, talked about the Holocaust extensively, and he wrote a paper called The Obscenity of Understanding. Why should understanding be the goal, especially if understanding is actually not a possibility? If understanding, if any time we understand, it's an illusion of understanding, and there are always other things that might challenge that understanding. So a pedagogy of uncertainty, and maybe even incomprehension, is called for. A pedagogy that can only, can only move forward through mutual inquiry. That mutual inquiry is a problem for us. Those of us who have slaved over earning PhDs and other kinds of advanced degrees want to feel like we know something. And once we feel we know something, it's kind of hard for me to sit down with an undergraduate student of 19 and say, we work together to find out because I may already know what I believe the destination is. But my destination might not be that person's destination. This is a quote from Shoshana Fulman. Lockham's unprecedented poetic pedagogy <coughs> always implicitly opens up onto the infinitely literary, infinitely teaching question. What is the navel of my own theoretical dream of understanding? What is the specificity of my incomprehension? What, riddle I po what is the riddle I pose here under the guise of knowledge? I particularly love this last sentence, that underneath our certainties there are always open questions. And in fact, one of the, probably the only really good reason for working in a university is that we know, by virtue of our disciplines, that there's a lot that's not known. And so that's what keeps us curious. I mean, why would you bother doing research or writing if you felt everything was already found out? It would seem silly. Everything seems found out to our undergraduates because it's very circumscribed. Our, our complexity is, is, is the richness. So if you ask a high school student, for instance, would they become a mathematics professor, they would, most high school students would vehemently say no because the notion of mathematics we teach to students is closed. But if you talk to a mathematician, it's infinite. And I think we fail to give our students the infiniteness of knowledge because we don't pose the riddle with them we act like we do know when we actually don't. Now, Fulman was teaching a course at Yale at the time she wrote her, her paper that I'm quoting here. And she introduced a historical and autobiographical testimony in the form of videos about the Holocaust from the Fortune of Video Archive, which is available on the web, of course. And students, she, she, that's the moment when students made the leap from mere cognitive engagement with the class, which is sort of participating, asking questions, and apparently learning, to an encounter with the unconscious. Feldman and her students, all equally surprised by the emotional crisis produced by the intensity of the testimony, were forced to regroup. So one of the things that Feldman argues she learned from this is that learning will not occur unless some kind of crisis is induced, a crisis of meaning or a crisis of understanding. Contrary to humanistic notions of teaching which tend to privilege comfort over all else, Feldman suggests that the induction of some sense of crisis appears necessary to engage latent knowledge and precipitate some kind of awakening in students. And again, if you've read Paul Freire's work, you notice that he uses the word anesthetized a lot to indicate that students are indeed asleep, that their capacity to understand is, is based upon... It's, it's somnolent, they're sleeping. And so the question is, can we shake people into some form of weakness? This is a very tricky 
question in my university, I don't know about here. In my university, we have student evaluations, and student evaluations are based upon popularity. I had one colleague who used to bake uh, cupcakes for students' birthdays to try and generate popularity. So, if you decide to make your teaching a place that is potentially uncomfortable, you run the risk of reducing your evaluations and therefore the, earning the wrath of your administration. I had a dean come to me, a very lovely lady, Aaron, and she came to me and she says, Michael, most of your students aren't filling out their evaluations. You have to make them do this. I said, it's a choice. And she said, well, you have to do better next time because the university weighs their estimation of my work not upon some powerful learning that a student may experience at some point in their life, but upon their rating of me based upon how comfortable they feel in my presence. So, so I think the notion of making learning uncomfortable is, is, is a good one, though I disagree a little bit with um, Feldman. While Feldman suggests that a crisis is necessary to provoke an address to the unconscious, I think perhaps it's a bit more subtle. Students already know when intimations of dread are making their presence felt. They just need to be in the company of someone who presents not as a fearless leader or omniscient interpreter, but as somebody who has visited such places before and can with humility take them as far down the road to as deep a place as they are comfortable venturing in. I, I, I have heard Paul Afraida speak and, listen, and watched his videotapes and if you see one word that occurs quite frequently in his work, it was the word humility. And I think humility is very important and the idea that the only tool we have to bring new people into our field, which is ultimately probably the whole point of teaching, is the journey we have taken and the journey we are actually taking. And so some, all of you probably have some people who are heavily invested in your discipline, who come in excited, who want to be an acolyte to you and who want to learn from you and you induct them into the field because of their enthusiasm about joining you. But I think we should do that for all of our students and tell them that, you know, this is a journey we can take together and see where it leads, rather than you saying, you have to do this because this is a building block that I've been told you need and you must take it. For instance, all of my courses, without exception, begin with an autobiogra autobiographical invitation. The students cannot be expected to embark on a journey from any point other than their own starting points. So if you come in and you start a basic lecture in your discipline and don't allow any time for students to connect that to their own experience, it's likely to be disconnected. Do you know what the concept of Velcro means? Velcro is a, fa a plastic fastener you use to hold your coat together. Well, if you think of Velcro as, as sort of something in the mind, things need to attach to other things. And if my talk doesn't attach to anything in your mind, you'll say, well, that was a waste, as you walk out of the room. And if it connects to something because of an anecdote I, I make or a question I respond to if you ask me a question, then there's a possibility of connection, and then it will have meaning. Why we would take 18 and 19 year olds and put them into a university class where they sit and listen, you know, look at PowerPoints, and write tests, and then leave without ever engaging in conversation so that they can make meaning for themselves. It's impossible for me to understand. And so I do this in two ways. I typically have students write autobiographical reflections, and I require all of my students to write to me every week so that I can respond and see if, they, if and how they're struggling with the material, or if they're not struggling with the material, well, whether we need to have conversation to help them find a way in. Finding a way in is very difficult for students, and I think that we underestimate that. To emphasize that that was a journey where the only tools required were humility and a capacity for exploring their own vulnerability, I begin by sharing with them some aspects of my own autobiography. And we know, for instance, that most professors hide from their students. Professors who come from working class don't tell the students of their social class origins. Students perceive professors as all middle class or privileged persons. And so it's very hard for students who come from, say, working class or gender variant or ethnic variant backgrounds to identify with somebody like me. Unless I share some way that causes them to relate to my experience in some way so that they can see I made a journey. Now, their journey and my journey don't have to be the same journey, but I did a journey, and journeying is what we're about. And I don't want them to make my journey, I'd rather they took an easier path, truthfully, but that they can make their own journey. 
My hope is that witnessing the kind of inner journey in my thinking gives them permission, if they need it, to view the learning experience I, I offer as primarily a space for internal work, as well as a place for intellectual understanding and new thought. What does it take to get an undergraduate student to consider themselves an intellectual? As somebody who can express an idea. About 10 years ago or 12, I, I've been co-chair for a number of years of a conference called Psychoanalysis, Culture and Society. I stepped down this year to become editor of the journal. But about 12 years ago, my first year attending, planning to attend that conference, I sent in a paper and it was accepted for presentation. And I got a copy of the program. And I read the program and thought, shit, I don't belong here. These people are way ahead of me. And I went through my paper. Luckily, I went back the following year, and I did find a way in with the help of a colleague. But I think a lot of people don't know how to find a way in, and it is our responsibility to say, you can come, come on in, we'll help you find a path. Rather than saying, you know, as my professors did when I was in University College Dublin in Ireland, where I studied Gaelic and psychology, and the Gaelic professors were the most elite people in the world, and they basically wanted to get rid of as many people as possible. At my very first lecture in, in, in the Gaelic language at college, a professor gave us a translation and said, bring this back next week. I forgot to do it, of course, and I sat in the cafeteria right before class and did it without a dictionary. I got a D. I'm sitting next to a friend of mine. She got a B. The professor came to enter the class, wrote on the board A equals 50% or better. If you didn't get an A now, leave now. 50% of the people walked out of that room, about 300. And I said, shit, I'm not leaving. And my colleague who got the bee left. I knew it was a ruse to just wipe us out. It wasn't an invitation to come in, it was an invitation to keep, to a rejection to stay out. So I really worry about our capacity to give access to students to thinking of themselves as intellectuals, as people with something to say, as people who could actually change the world, as people who could do internal work of some kind. All of my students are, oh, now this is for a particular class, yeah, but this is true of all my classes. Students are invited to write to me weekly, and this becomes, this is written for one class, but it becomes a private conversational space that many students use to begin working through the interaction between their own internal life and the new ideas we encounter through provocative texts and film work. Now, you might say to me, if you have, as I have in a typical semester, 100 or 120 students, how can you have 120 students write to you? Very simple. I don't prepare any lectures. I don't give any tests and I don't correct any tests. I have time to do other things instead. It's a question of how you define your work. I encourage the students to the extent possible, this refers in particular to a clinical psychology class and trauma that I taught, to experience the experience of being in the class rather than to dissect, analyze, or intellectualize the experience of the testimony we were watching. I'm interested in students reacting to their own visceral reactions to the material and then allowing themselves to free associate so that their internal process becomes explicit and the assumptions can be examined. You say, I have students watch some video about trauma, I'll say, I'd like you to watch the video and see what you can learn, but I also want you to watch yourself watching and let's talk about what that's doing for you so we can get a sense of your process. Now, for my final assignment in my trauma and history class, it's called Trauma, History and Memory, uh, I, I get some directions. I would like you to think of this project very much in a psychoanalytic sense as a working through. That expression comes from Freud who talked about the, the need to work through ideas. If I just told you you have a certain kind of psychological problem and you could, or you could go buy a book in a bookstore and it would tell you, I've got this, that doesn't help anybody to improve. So Freud said we have to work it through. Working through the emotions produced by all that you met and were exposed to this semester. Try to understand the moments when you engage with traumatic narrative and the moments when you mobilize your defenses to avert your eyes or turn your face away. And then it continues. Feldman, who I mentioned to my students and they read, reminds us that teaching and psychoanalysis are interested not merely in new information, but primarily in the capacity of recipients to transform themselves in function of the, of the newness of that information. I would like you to address that process of transformation in yourself. You might find it worthwhile to conceptualize this project in personal ways, for instance, through autobiographical exhumation of parts of your own personal and family histories, or through your interest in and involvement with some world, national, or local trauma. Now, I don't do that in my undergraduate class in the same way, but I do have all of my undergraduates write to me at the end of the year an essay self-evaluating their learning 
and I promise to them that if their evaluation of their learning differs from mine, we'll have a conversation before I make a grade, so that they have some agency in the process of evaluating their learning. I haven't actually given a formal lecture to a college class at any level since 1986, that first semester when I was a professor. Students read in advance and come to class prepared with questions for discussion required. Likewise, their weekly writings allow me to access their questioning process. Now, you might say, well, I have a lot of students in my class. This is only practical if you have small numbers. I've done this with classes as large as 65 people without difficulty. Uh, I skip that. I'm very concerned about the decline of what we call liberal education. The, I'm speaking of the US context, but I have colleagues in England and Australia and New Zealand who have similar worries, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's spreading here as well, because the neoliberal ideology began as a political vision, probably going back to Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, but has shifted into many of the disciplines in the form of what are called, quote, evidence-based technologies. I'm very concerned about the decline of liberal education in the humanities as technology, number one, and neoliberal ideologies transform the very idea of a university. I see this, for instance, where I work. I'm in two divisions of the university, and in each of those divisions we have an accrediting body that decides what the discipline should be about. And those accrediting bodies specify what each of our syllabuses should look like. And I have my dean, for instance, in psychology sends us a note saying, your syllabus must look like the following and use these headings. However, if you disagree with this, that's fine. My student will make the changes for you. Because there is a desire to, first of all, control the, the wording of our knowledge and ultimately to control the content of the knowledge with which our students are engaged. I find that to be the antithesis of what I would hope a university would be. What the heck is this? <laughs> There's a word missing here. This was, I was testing your ability to pay attention. But I don't even know what's missing. Oh, a robust uh, uh, Thanks, I got it. You're laughing, help me. A robust intellectual tradition has emerged in scholarship, and many of you may be from fields where this is true, building from a critique of master narratives, for instance, uh, postmodernism and postcolonialism and queer theory and so on, I've done this, of power and of white privilege, Exploration of the intersectionalities of race, class, gender, oppressions, and the complexities of articulating an education mission wrapped around more inclusive and critical ideas. That stuff is out there. We all know that stuff is out there, no doubt. Well, you may have, I certainly am familiar with that stuff. Yet, for all the vibrancy of these academic traditions, the college learning experience risks going backwards. Can we use distance learning tools for critical education purposes? Can we resist regulation? that risks making the curriculum dumb and the students inert absorbers of factoids of knowledge. The trend in online education, as far as I can see in the US, is to not use professors, but to hire one big name person, give that person a fee to write the syllabus, and then in each university to have somebody, with or without a PhD, to assist in delivery of predetermined instruction from this outside expert. I would find that to be uh, obnoxious. Prescriptive and reductionistic, reductionistic teaching techniques negate discursive understandings of subjectivity and fail to acknowledge the location of students as meaning makers who are embedded in the discursive and ideological matrices. I did a few last minute edits last night, I apologize, there's a few extraneous words in there. So the question then I have for you is, is it possible to have a pedagogical intent to assist our students in reading their discursive locations critically? or in trying out subaltern identifications. Again, if you go back to Paul Freire, written in the language of 1970, I read his book for the first time when I was 19. This is Read the Word to Read the World. Are we responsible as universities? Do we have a mission of creating a critical, informed citizenry? A clear example of dangerous reductionism in the US is the hegemonic system of accreditation imposed in university departments. Suppose that standards are articulated by professional education association, association, which, in collusion with state regulators and commercial publishers, have developed supposedly evidence-based practices and reductionist norms for student competence. And then all of us are saddled with implementing these norms. You won't get a more egregious example of this than the United States educational system. But I work in psychology too, and it's very close behind in catching up. 
In clinical psychology and in education, for example, in the two fields in which I work, we are required to develop syllabi that conform to standard templates in structure, objectives, and language. Can it be long before they dictate the content and modes of evaluation also? And I challenge you to go to 10 different universities in the United States and look up their syllabi and not see that they all actually look exactly alike. It's really very frightening. George Orwell would be proud. <laughs> Evidence-based curriculum in US colleges is a code word for ideological conformity and positivist, reductionist definition of knowledge and achievement. If you want to drive me crazy, it's not actually that hard. Go to a university administration meeting where people use the word evidence-based like they mean it. It really frightens me that there's no critical examination at all. This trend, I believe, <coughs> excuse me, is intimately tied in with the goals of the neoliberal state apparatus that has gained so much traction in so many parts of the world. Can advances in artificial intelligence and neoliberal regulation reduce us to laborers in knowledge factories serving a corporate state master? Or you could add three more dots after that and say, or render us obsolete completely. I think certainly I see the risk as being there. We can only hope, I think, that as the movement grows more totalizing, this is my optimism piece here, that as the movement grows more totalizing, it would contain dialectical elements that would cause critique and counter-hegemonic practices to emerge in how we do our work. And I promise you, the election of Donald Trump is not that open. It might be something else, but we'll see. From a perspective of revolutionary praxis, Antonio Gramsci's notion of organic intellectual is fruitful in thinking about the struggle around knowledge. Could it be that in modeling social justice-oriented praxis in our pedagogy and in our intellectual work, and seeking to practice as organic intellectuals, we can create an opportunity for students to join us in just such a critical practice. So in other words, it wouldn't be the professors and the students as two different categories, but it would be professors and students together. Paul Freire I might even have it here. Yes, the quote where he talks about teachers as students and students as teachers. Now, Freire said, through dialogue, the teacher of the students and the students of the teachers cease to exist and a new term emerges. Teacher-student with students-teachers. The teacher is no longer merely the one who teaches, but who is himself taught in dialogue with the students, who in turn, while being taught, also teach. They become jointly responsible for a process in which all grow. In this process, arguments based on authority are no longer valid. In order to function, authority must be on the side of freedom, not against it. Now, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but at one point, Paul Freire was Minister for Education in Sao Paulo State, am I right? Right? Yeah. So let's be honest with ourselves. <clears throat> however, this let's be honest with ourselves, however, this pedagogical strategy cannot work in the service of utilitarian modes of education that are focused only on economic value. And that's the discourse of most university administrators. It can only work for forms of college pedagogy that seek to foster values of receptivity, cultural respect, open minded and critical imaginaries. In these coldly utilitarian times, we, need, we, professors, need to provide leadership to progressively minded students to allow them to protect our world from totalitarian forces and allow for the emergence of new imaginaries. This presentation drew on two of my papers. This is the first one. If you have any interest in this stuff, I'd be glad to send it to you. And this is the second. My website if you'd like to learn more, my email if you'd like to correspond with me, and thank you. It really was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Yeah. It was a pleasure for us to have you here. Um, so we have a lot of time for questions. We'd be happy to take them. If you want to ask your question in Portuguese, feel free, I'll just do the translation here and send it by the minutes. My name is Cesar Nunes. I work in a group here that is uh, devoted to moral education. Moral education, yes. 
uh, but I have a long trajectory in teaching for understanding, and I used to collaborate with uh, David Perkins from Harvard Graduate School of, uh, of Education. And he has a definition of understanding that is, to understand is to be able to think and act flexibly with what you know. So that is, you just don't know mechanically, but you act and uh, think flexibly. And they have a, a long tradition on how to teach for this kind of understanding. And how do you uh, consider, you, you made a critique to understanding, mm -hmm. and they focus all their work on understanding. Could you comment on sure. the two approaches? Thank you for such an easy question. <laughs> I haven't read David Perkins' work in a long time, so I'm, I may misinterpret, but I think I take, my, my stance is probably different in two respects. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in students' political development and students' reading of the political world in which they live. And I'm very concerned about student agency and empowerment. So for me it is more than, the work is more than an intellectual work, though I think that part is subsumed within it. And the other part is that because of my psychoanalytic training, I'm very, I'm very aware that in spite of our best intentions, we have deep resistances, and so I'm very interested in finding ways to reach past those resistances in students. So for instance, no matter what course I teach, I use some novels, and I try to use some film. Because those, those media tend to get past the barriers of the conscious mind and provoke deeper levels of thought that complement the kind of stuff that Perkins talks about. So I would see this as, as more politically informed and more depth oriented, but, but not inconsistent with the work of David Perkins and his comics. That would be my sense. You could disagree with that, of course. It's okay? Okay. I, I, I think I've been collaborating also with Bob Selman from King Harvard, and yes. he has the, this other part, and he has been using films and novels to, to introduce the uh, moral uh, development. So I agree with you, so both parts are important. I haven't read uh, Bob Selman's work in years, that you've given me a reason to look it up. Thank you. said about uh, becoming a student of these students' um, resistance. Thank you. I, 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 think, I think the nature of being human is that we try and limit our understanding because too many things are frightening. I mean, if you talk to people in the United States about the current political situation, most people don't want to talk about it because it opens up too much fear about danger about a nuclear war, for instance, or about 20 million people losing their health care, or, or all sorts of other fears that people have in that context. And I've talked to people here about fears here. I think the natural reaction of people when, when they encounter something new, if it provokes anxiety in them, is to, to try to avoid. So I think, I guess I didn't mention this earlier, but one of the core principles of my work with students is that learning has to be an anxiety-free space that you have to recognize anxiety is present and you have to work with students to, to pass the anxiety so that you can... The anxiety represents the resistance because once they get experience resistance, it produces anxiety. So my role with them is to create a space in which we can collaborate together that's not filled with threat and pressure because that just will cause them to avoid. So if they do appear to be learning, and this is one of my worries with, with sort of the things you mentioned, students can simulate learning and look like they're thinking and write really good papers for us and leave entirely cynical and say, that was bullshit. Mm -hmm. So if you want them not to do that, I think we have to create a space where those insecurities can emerge and be talked about. So they find out that it's legitimate to fear progressive ideas or to fear social change or to fear reading a new theory. If I ask a student to read Lockdown's work, 
I know how hard it is. It's impossibly difficult for me. And they're going to experience shame, anxiety, and all sorts of things. So to bring them in, I have to find a way to... I, I, don't, I wouldn't say confront the resistance, because that implies confrontation, but to invite them in so we can talk about their resistance and help them believe that it's possible for them to do something they thought they couldn't do. Such as the time, for instance, I withdrew my paper from the conference and went back the following year. My withdrawing of the paper was based upon a resistance, based upon an imagining. And that was actually an incorrect imagining, which I developed by reading very fancy, sophisticated titles in a, in a conference program. Once I started going to a conference, I realized that people make fancy titles for papers that are not necessarily very fancy. But that took me a while to figure out. So I, I think it's about creating a space where it becomes speakable to talk about learning difficulty. Rather than a student sitting in a room like this and thinking, everybody else gets this except me, I must be dumb. Or this is bullshit, but I'll fake it for the professor and I don't care. And I think either way we have a problem. We have to find some way to engage authentically. And that requires, I think, talking with students about their difficulties and helping them to find a way in. I wrote a paper two years ago. Uh, I got awarded a career award. It's a very bad thing when you get a career award because people are starting to say goodbye. They gave me an award, so I was telling me I've been around perhaps too long. But the, I wrote a paper as a statement of thanks for the conference. I called it Finding a Way In. How difficult it was for me when I became a professor to find a way in. My parents had no education, and when I say no education, I mean no education. And uh, nobody in my family had ever gone to college in my generation, and before my generation they hadn't even finished fourth grade or fifth. So, so there was no precedent for me to do this. And so how do I find a way in? It was very difficult. And being the hostile, difficult, contrarian person I am, when I couldn't find a way in, I got angry at all the people who were inside, because they were in, and I was banging on the door and not finding a way in. So gradually, through the help of some people who reached out a hand and brought me in and said, you know, come with us, come to dinner with us, come on a panel with us, we'll help you find a way in. I did find a way in, so I'm very sensitive with students that many, many students would like to find a way into being a mathematician, or a physicist, or a chemist, or a psychologist, or an anthropologist, or a historian, or whatever you want, but they don't know how to find a way in. And me appearing at the top of the classroom as an erudite professor is not helping them, no more than if I were a ballet dancer dancing a beautiful dance that somebody could say, I too could be a dancer. They can only believe they could be a dancer if they get in conversation with me and I show them that it's possible to find a path to, to expertise, that expertise is, is a path. Is that enough for you? I can, if you'd like, talk very specifically about my pedagogy with a particular kind of class, which is my undergraduate class, if you're interested, but I don't want to bore you to death. Yes? Yeah. Let me tell you, and I have, by the way, on my website, some of the links are not working, I have to work on it more, but I usually have all of my current syllabi on my website, or you can email me. But basically, the way I lay out my course, my under, I teach an undergraduate course in psychology called Child Development, for instance. That has a mandatory content that must be covered, and this is a question you could all ask, how do you deal with mandatory content the discipline requires? So I deal with it in two ways. I use a conventional textbook, we meet twice a week. I use a conventional textbook on my Tuesday class, a chapter a week, which covers all the core content. Not always to my liking, but there's material there that we can read and deconstruct. And then students, with my assistance, because I give them some questions to help them, come to class each week with questions, some of which are my questions and some of theirs, and we spend the class first in small groups discussing and then together as a large group talking about the issues they found puzzling or difficult. So that covers my obligation to cover the basic nuts and bolts that the course requires. On Thursdays each week, then I say, don't bring the textbook, we're not going to be doing cognitive knowing, we're going to be doing something else. And my Thursday class is devoted to novels and films and poetry, which allow me to get them to imagine the experience of childhood from different cultures, classes, gender variants, and all kinds of things, so that other ways of experiencing childhood are brought into the room. In terms of assignments, they write to me every single week, mandatory. I check off the writing, not graded, but mandatory that they produce writing. And the writing cannot be a summary, because I'm not interested in it. I tell them, if I've read the book, 
and I read 25 summaries, I'm just going to die. So don't give me a summary because I don't want a summary. I want to see that you're running on your treadmill, that you're doing some active thinking and engaging. Now that running might be an idea from the book that requires exploration, or it could be relating the book to an experience in another part of their lives. They also do uh, two academic papers which I grade super hard, and I tell them I will grade them really rigorously, in midterm and final, but I, I give them this concession, that if they go below a certain percentage in their grade, they can rewrite it. I'm not interested in proving I can give people a C or a B. I'm interested in them learning as much as possible. And if a student says, I see where I went wrong, or they come to me for a meeting, and say, okay, I think I know what I need to do, they have an opportunity to rewrite, without any penalty. Because it's not about me putting numbers in a book, it's about me satisfying myself that this person has engaged with the material. They also do three book reviews of, of three novels that we read during the semester. Again, not summaries, but responses to the work that show me they're thinking about the work. They do a field study, because I want them to apply this knowledge in the field. And they do something else, but I can't remember what it is. So I have what I call multimodal assessment, where they're assessed intellectually with the term papers, they're assessed intellectually with the book reviews, they're given weekly writing. Oh yes, they also do... I have doctoral students who are my graduate assistants. I don't use them in the class, but all my students write six letters to a doctoral student about their life experience and how the course is going. And my doctoral students respond back to them. At the, end, at the end of the semester, I collect all that correspondence and read it too. But the nice thing about it is they're not responding to me as their professor. They're corresponding with somebody else. So they might have possibility of being more free and not worrying about my role or status in responding to them. So I try and do multimodal assessment that gives students many different ways to achieve and that no one of them is so privileged that a student who has poor skills in a given area is destined to fail, so that they have multiple ways of, of achieving in the <coughs> Is that clear enough for the same one? of uh, learning communities um, and we introduced some basic principles for the people to participate in these communities in such a way that there is real uh, knowledge advancement and knowledge advancement we, we think is in uh, all the full spectrum so personal and social right. and so but uh, we rely a, a lot on these uh, communities because then you take out the focus of the teacher and then the, the students that, that put all this resistance maybe it's easier for them and we are using uh, platforms for, for that for instance we use the knowledge forum that was developed by copywriter Marine Scadamaya from the University of Toronto where it has uh, scaffolds to, uh, to, to think to be metacognitive on how you are participating and we introduce rubrics for them to think about the process if they are being respectful, if they are being agents, in extended agents. So I would like to, to know your uh, thoughts about using this students' community, interaction among students. Thank you. That's a, another great question. Uh, we should correspond. I'd really like to learn more about the methods you're using. Um, I actually the principal metaphor in my mind for the work we do is learning community. And in all of my classes, I should say, for instance, when my undergraduate students meet with me, from the very beginning when they work in small groups, I rotate them so they can build senses of community and give them collaborative spaces to work and act together so that it's not, learning is not individualized. But I don't do it at the formal level that you're doing. I'd certainly would like to know more about that. I think it might be very helpful. And I absolutely agree, if, if we reduce learning to only the individual, it's going to be greatly diminished. And the, the power of community is really important. And students can do an awful lot more for themselves than we realize and help each other to enhance their learning. It does not have to be directed by or centered on the faculty's position. So I, I, I could say that, but without knowing more about the frameworks you use, it's hard for me to respond more. In principle, I agree fully. Yeah, I'd actually like to learn more about that. Thank you. Thank 
Thanks, uh, Dr. Michael. Um, it was a real pleasure and very inspirational, I think. Uh, I'm sure you've talked about, you've talked about uh, the U.S. a lot in your presentation. And I'm sure you heard all sorts of things about the situation in Brazil here I've heard over the last week. Um, and we're actually facing the same general problem, a shift towards conservatism. Fundamentalism. Fundamentalism. Yeah. And the law is actually changing to require high schools to be more square, less questioning. And this is the kind of students we're receiving uh, at our university. Precisely. So then you'll have the product coming in the university. Exactly. On the other hand, I feel like our students are demanding um, when they come here, that demanding that we do that sort of work with them. They want us to, which is great. It's just a problem of us finding a way. So it was very inspirational for me. Thanks a lot. And thanks for everybody uh, for coming here. Thank you.